Nowadays, we don't hear much about the dangers of backsliding. Backsliding in the scriptures is always seen as a very serious matter. When we hear the word backsliding, it comes with several negative connotations and conveys an image of an individual falling into open and even gross sin. While backsliding certainly includes this, it is not necessarily limited to just this. You see, backsliding is not limited to simply falling backwards, but it is also failing to go forward spiritually. The truth is, growth is a principle. If there is no growth, there is a problem. If you and I are not moving forward in Christ, then we are naturally going backward. In the Christian life, there is no standing still. We are either progressing or regressing. Jeremiah 2 verse 19 Your own wickedness will correct you and your backsliding will rebuke you. Know therefore and see that it is an evil and bitter thing that you have forsaken the Lord your God and fear of him is not in you says the Lord God of hosts. Jeremiah 3.22 says, Return you backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. It is however alarming to see quite the number of believers getting swayed to the point of backsliding and not realizing it. So you begin to wonder, how does an individual backslide and not know? Or did it just happen over the process of time or was it a sudden event? Well, there are clear indicators that show us that someone is backsliding. And this is what I use personally to evaluate my life. I am preaching to myself today just as much as I am preaching to you. Firstly, a clear indication that we're backsliding is a decrease in our prayer time. Prayer is an essential lifeline that sustains every single believer. The action word pray is mentioned 313 times in the King James Version of the Bible, while the noun prayer is mentioned 114 times. There is no substitute for prayer. To have a Christian experience with God that is second to none and full of quality and life-changing purposeful experiences Prayer must be continually offered. I don't think some of you know how important your prayer life is. Your prayer life is a direct indicator of your relationship with God. You cannot separate your prayer life to your Christian walk. How do you expect to develop and nurture a relationship with God when you don't speak to him? How do you expect to walk in authority and in power when you don't go to the source of all authority and all power? One week without prayer makes one week. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 admonishes us to pray without ceasing. Don't stop praying. And the truth is, some of you who are listening to me right now, your prayer life is not what it used to be. There was a time in your life when you used to pray and all the demons of hell within a mile radius would run. But somewhere along the line, you gave up. Somewhere along the line, you stopped praying. Remember, the seven sons of Sceva were asked by the demon spirit in Acts 19.15, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Jesus' name was known in hell. Paul's name was known in hell. Why? Because they were men of prayer. This goes to show us the importance of prayer. As a believer, you must never get to the point where prayer becomes one of those things you do once in a while. We must not only pray in emergencies. We must not only pray when we're in trouble. We are instructed clearly in the Bible to pray without ceasing. That means in good times and in bad times. In whatever time in your life you are in right now, you are told and instructed by the word of God to continue in prayer, to never stop, to never relent. Let us not get to a point where we don't pray anymore. 
or we pray for just 60 seconds just to tick the box that we've prayed today. No, it doesn't work that way. Any relationship that you want to grow requires quality time. It is a compulsory requirement. If we want our relationship with God to grow, we need to spend time in his presence. We need to seek his face. Another indication is a loss of conviction. The moment your prayer altar as a believer begins to grow cold, you begin to lose conviction in the things of God. Lack of conviction is what makes a believer begin to sin willfully. This is really dangerous and can become a major pitfall. The prophet Habakkuk said that God's eyes are too pure to behold sin. God can never compromise his standard of holiness. Sin stands between the sinner and the loving God. Why will a person call God and yet not receive a response? It is the problem of sin. There is no doubt that the hands of God are not too short, that they cannot save. However, people still perish. It is true that God is not dull of hearing, yet many people's calls are disregarded by him. The reason for all of these is that sin separates us from God. We limit the greatness of God when we begin to commit sins that will not allow him to prove his awesomeness in our lives. Oswald Smith once said that it is either the Bible takes you from sinning or sin will stop you from studying it. Sinners will always be known to live their lives in isolation from God. No one will ever be bold to read and to study the Bible or to come to the presence of God with filthiness. Sin has a way of separating us from God. It is not the judgment of sin that separates a man from God. It is sin itself. Remember that God had not yet pronounced judgment against the sin of Adam and Eve before they hid themselves from his presence. Sin isolates us from divine presence. The effect of sin will be more grievous if after we have given our lives to Christ, we choose to sin willfully. Do you ever wish to enjoy a sweet fellowship with the Holy Spirit? Do you want to live close to the heart of God? Once you remove the barrier of sin, your access to God cannot be denied. You may find it hard to believe this, but that's just the truth. He loves you and wants to associate closely with you. Galatians 6, 7 says, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. God wants you to sow in spiritual life so that you can live a life that is pleasing unto him. The third and final indication we're gonna look at today is indifference to evangelism or salvation of others. 1 Timothy 2.4 it is the will of God for all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Salvation is at the peak of the plans and purposes of God for humanity. It is a priority to him and as such it must be a priority to us. This gospel of the kingdom must be preached. I genuinely believe that if we got a glimpse of hell, if we just saw 10 seconds, our view on preaching the gospel would change. Hell is a place you wouldn't wish upon your worst enemy. And the truth is, hell is a topic that is seldomly preached in the 21st century. But the truth is, hell is as much of a reality in the Bible as heaven. Hell is a place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hell is a place where the rich man went after he died in the Bible. And we see this in Luke 16, 23. And in hell he lifted up his eyes. Just imagine what the rich man saw 
when he lifted up his eyes and realized where he was, the thoughts that raced through his head, there is no exit, there are no second chances. I believe when the rich man lifted up his eyes, he must have thought it was a bad dream and that he would wake up in a moment. But that was his eternity. How can we live with the knowledge of this and not preach the gospel? 